Hey folks, apologies. Um, somehow the last meeting didn't get stopped properly and so we got delayed on this one. Is someone willing to share the meeting minutes from this meeting? Sorry, I had trouble joining the meeting. It said uh, another meeting was in progress and it wouldn't let me in. <clears throat> yeah, I had the same issue. Um, and so um, I, I, I'm not quite sure what went on there. I, I poked the LF to see what their advice is for how to avoid that in the future. Um, cool. Oh, thank you, Ashley, for adding the, the, the meeting stuff. If folks do go ahead and please add themselves to the attendee list, that's very helpful. Cool. So, uh, should we get started? Cool. It'll also be good if we get someone to share the meeting notes. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and get started. So, welcome to the next Network Service Mesh Working Group. Um, if you haven't added yourself yet, please add yourself to the attendee list. Um, we have this particular call, which occurs every Tuesday at 8 a.m. We also have a call every other week um, at 3 a.m. Pacific time. We also have, we also participate in the CNCO Telecom User Group, which occurs every Monday at 8 a.m. and every, every first Monday at 8 a.m. and every third Monday at 3 a.m. Pacific. We also participate in the CNCF SIG network, which has been rebooted and um, is uh, occurs every first and third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, this particular group is uh, is a little bit interesting now because they they now spend time vetting things for the CNCF. So, uh, if you're looking to get more involved with the CNCF, that's a fantastic way to do so. We also um, we also have a few events coming up. So on March 18th, there is a Go San Francisco meetup, which I will be talking about Cloud Native Zero Trust. And uh, March 30th through April 2nd is KubeCon and Cloud NativeCon Europe at the RAI in Amsterdam. Um, schedules are up and NSMCon is going to be on March 30th, co-located with KubeCon. The schedule is now up. So if you would like to see what we will be talking about at NSMCon, please go take a look. We have Open Networking and Edge Summit North America. Uh, we're waiting for the schedules to be announced. Uh, that'll be April 20 to 21st. We have KubeCon and Cloud NativeCon China. The CFPs have already closed and the schedule will be announced in May. We have ONES in Europe. The CFPs close on June 7th and that'll be in Antwerp on September 29th or 30th. In November 17th through 20th is the KubeCon Cloud Native Con North America Boston. Um, the CFPs will open in April 22nd, so the day after ONES, and they will close in June 12th. Uh, announcements will be in September 14th, and um, I don't think there's other events that we know about, so um, there, 
we have, uh, again, just a reminder, we have a project page. Uh, the link is, uh, is listed on the, uh, on the meeting notes. And are there any other announcements that we want to do before we move on? I'm assuming not. So in that, in that scenario, social media community team. Uh, Ashley, uh, you have the floor. Hi everybody. Um, so the last week, as far as social media went, was pretty exciting. We reached our next milestone of officially having 700 followers on Twitter. So that was <laughs> exciting to see. Uh, we gained 17 followers in the last week. We followed 15 in additional counts and tweeted and retweeted 26 posts. So as I mentioned, that surpassed the 700 followers. As far as other things that were tweeted about, NSMCon related, we got some registration reminders out there. The schedule announcement went out last night and there are already a few people retweeting their, um, their schedules, their sessions, I'm sorry. So that's exciting to see as well. Outside of that, some general call reminders, video recaps, some CNCF news as far as promoting some events coming up, OSS in China later in the year. Um, some CNCF and LF events, just again, letting everyone know that childcare is provided at those events. So just trying to get some additional attendees there for some parents. And other events that were promoted this last week was the introduct introduction to Network Service Mess, Service Mesh meetup that happened in Austin this week. So that was promoted a few times a tweet that went out thanking the attendees, as well as some retweets from others that had um, got some news out there um, that had attended that event. Some other general retweets, telecom user group meeting notes, CNCF blog, and some VMware open source tweets. And then as far as LinkedIn, a bit of a slower week. We only gained two additional followers, but at least we are still growing there. So hopefully this next week we'll continue to, um, to follow. And I guess at this point, we'll mainly focus on pushing sponsorship for NSMCon as we are a little over a month out and also promote the registration mostly. Outside of that, the meetup that's coming up in San Francisco later on in March and then other sessions related to NSMCon and KubeCon. Sounds excellent. Um, so really quick note to the folks who are speakers at NSMCon, you will find that your, your talk is actually individually linkable from the events page. So if you want to go and promote your talk, you can literally have a link that takes people directly to your talk on the events page. So it's very good stuff. Um, thank you very much, Ashley. This is awesome. It's super good to see us go over 700 followers. Oh, one other thing I did want to actually raise. So there's a really good blog post, Frederick. Do you have the link to it that came out of China about network service mesh that we may want to promote? Um, oh, it's a test video. Let me go grab it. Yeah, let me, let me see if I can find the link myself. It's been translated to English, which is super helpful um, because I otherwise would not know how amazing it is. Um, let me go ahead yeah. and add that to the agenda. Yeah, so it's, it's in uh, simplified Chinese and um, and English. Well, so I've put the link into the chat if you want to grab it from there. But it's it's super well done. Uh, apparently, there's some very thoughtful folks looking at what we're doing in China and writing really good things about it. Great, good to know. I'll get that out there then. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I'll also remind folks that you should feel free to add yourself to the agenda at any point. I added a few things, but I, I know there's more going on than, than what I've added. Um, back to you, Frederick. Did we lose Frederick? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Cool. And so, um, so with that, we have the uh, um, we have the main agenda that's coming up. So, um, 
Ed, do you want to talk about uh, what's going on this week in NSM? Uh, I can talk about some things. I, I've been sort of heads down, so I've not been following as much what's going generally. So if other folks have things, I'd encourage them to add them to the list as well in the agenda. Um, so the, the, the sort of things that, that, that sort of got my attention um, were the, uh, the, the command forwarder VPP agent repo has opened. And there's an initial code drop PR. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why the CI is not running on that repo. So that, that hasn't been merged yet because I don't want to merge code that hasn't gone through the CI. But it, the, the initial code drop is super simple. It's like a 50 line main file effectively at a Docker file. Um, everything else is being pulled through from the SDKs. Um, so that's landed. Um, and then there's some improvements to mechanism testing and, and that resulted in a bunch of generic things. So basically, uh, there's a link here to examples of the mechanism testing. Mechanisms are interesting because uh, we end up writing a bunch of them, right? You're going to have, you know, we've got like four or five different kinds of mechanisms and then you're going to rewrite those mechanism chain elements for each forwarder that supports them. So there are things that people are going to write a lot. Um, and so I, I put together a, a generic test suite to check that network chain elements for um, test suite for mechanisms did the right thing because their contract is fairly simple but straightforward which is they should set the mechanism preference um, before they call the next chain element and then when the next chain element returns they should do whatever they're supposed to do um, to for whatever they're doing for the mechanism but they've got to wait for the return because that's where they get the complete connection that's on the client side then on the server side uh, when they get their their call they should have the complete connection so they they just do whatever they're going to do um, and in doing that, um, ended up building up some very generic machinery. So for example, um, there's a whole set of network chain elements that do simple checking, right? So there's one to check to see if your chain returns an error. Um, because as it turns out, um, sometimes when you test a chain, it gets wrapped up in other pieces, um, and which is the case for mechanisms. And so you, you want to make sure you crisply understand that you've returned an error. Um, you know, check to see if the client propagates gRPC options. One of the things that's different between clients and servers is this extra uh, variadic uh, gRPC options um, thing. And because it's variadic, meaning that if it's not there, it's fine, um, I literally forget every single time. And so this is a simple thing that lets you write tests that simply check for that. Um, checking the contents of context um, after and on return from a chain element is important because it actually matters um, particularly in the case of mechanisms, when you have actually um, set up whatever things are in the context. Um, and then just generic things to check other aspects of the system, just to make sure, for example, that if you have a, a network service request after the chain, that you check it after the, immediately after that. Part of the reason this is here is that um, we wind up if you want to check to make sure that a request contains something, you've got to have a chain element to follow to catch that. Um, likewise, if you care about things being in the return connection at certain points in the, the chain you're testing, um, you know, basically a chain element that'll inject an error or inject your gRPC op options. And then it's very helpful at times to have a null chain element that you can use. So some basic stuff here. Um, now, generally speaking, and I, I think you made some points about this, Andre, in the previous call, you want to try and keep your testing as simple as possible. If you've just got a chain element that um, does a thing and returns the thing, um, then you probably want to be checking just that and not wrapping it up in additional complexity. But sometimes it matters um, when in the chain of things this happens. So for example, in the case of the mechanism stuff, where it lives in the context of a broader chain. Yeah, yeah. More interesting is if we have more complex chain elements uh, with integration to a VPP agent or to some library or kernel. We also need some integration tests for this kind of chain elements. No, totally. Um, you know, uh, I, I, that, that's, that's one of the nice things about the way the VPP agent SDK is put together is the only one that actually touches VPP agent is the commit. Um, everything else is just setting up the config for that. Um, and then one of the other things that's kind of interesting that's coming down to the VPP agent 3.01 is, um, the gRPC guys recently realized that it's hard to test if you pass a struct into everything. So the gRPC client connection, which is a struct, has been replaced in most places with the gRPC client connection interface. 
um, in generated code, which is an interface, which means you can mock it. Um, so we can actually mock that out with unit tests as well. Um, once we've made that transition. So th there's a lot of good stuff going there. Um, but the, the baseline point is let, let's keep the testing as simple as we can. And it, it happens that this chain element stuff makes it super easy to test a lot of these things. Um, any questions, comments, et cetera, on that? Yeah, as a person who's um, reviewing a lot of this stuff, uh, definitely, uh, I think we it would help if we can get some examples for people pointed out. Uh, and it could be examples in the code just to show show off some of the uh, more interesting areas. Um, I know there's a there's a lot on the agenda to to do though, so I, I know that that may not happen immediately, but just something we can add for later on. Well, there, there's been something bouncing around in the back of my head as I've been doing this. Um, and it's because uh, Denise actually poked me uh, and said, maybe we should have a style, uh, a style guide. And I think what he was meaning by that was less like indent four spaces, but more, if you're doing something sort of like this, then this is sort of the pattern that's been established and this is why the pattern is. Um, and that might be super interesting and helpful. So, um, see who added the CNF conformance uh, with NSM? Uh, that was me, Watson. I can cool. go if you so, want or can wait. Yeah, is there, is there anything else you want to talk about on that, Ed? Or No, I think that's about it. I, I was basically providing some pointers to folks. Um, but I, I think Andre's underlying point of keep your tests as simple as you can possibly keep them is a good one. Um, but I, I think we may also want to consider in the case of things that are um, going to be done a lot, like mechanisms, writing a few test suites here and there. Um, I don't want to get too crazy with that. If you're just doing a one-off, it's probably not worth writing a test suite. But if you're doing something that's going to be, things like that are going to be done a lot of places, then it may be worth it. Cool. Um, OK, Watson, you have the floor. Okay, so um, there is a new initiative um, on the, in the CNCF called the CNF Conformance Initiative. It's basically, it's kind of an outgrowth of what the test bed was, um, but basically checking CNF, uh, Cloud Native Network Functions. So um, within this community, it's really network services, and um, we're needing to have some examples for the conformance suite that come out of the box. Um, there are some trivial examples um, just that, that we're using now. But one of the things that we need to develop is a, a good story of a journey from um, a maybe a VNF world or just a non-conforming or non-compliant CNF into one that's more compliant and pretty, um, Pretty uh, sure that NSM would be a good a good fit for as, as many different pieces, but the declarative portion. So just from our experience from taking VNFs from lots of hard coded subnets, IP addresses, and all of that stuff, um, is there maybe we can grab some low hanging fruit um, from maybe some examples that NSM has. Um, where someone might be hard coding some things and then when the addition, the addition of NSM makes it easier to have things be a, in a more declarative uh, fashion. So um, trying to put that out there, uh, if you guys can point me to something or if you want to help um, get that into the test bed. Um, I'm sorry, the scene of conformance, well, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah. The thing that jumps out to me is, and in, in, in this I think comes from sort of standard 12 factor op, op thinking, which is um, an application should learn things from its environment. And things like IP addresses are literally things that you learn from your environment at NSM. Um, 
-hmm. you know, so basically it's things should learn from their environments and the system should be dynamic because dynamic things are resilient. Static things tend to be really, really unresilient. Um, and then the other one that comes to mind is a scoping argument, which is if I statically, part of why static things are not resilient is if I statically configure a bunch of stuff in a bunch of places, um, the scope over which I have to get that right is the global scope. And the global scope is really fragile. Um, you make one little mistake and you're fucked. Um, whereas <laughs> if you can localize things to a much smaller scope, then the scope over which you have to get them right is very, very limited. Um, and so you're much less, much more likely to get it right. Does that make sense? That, that does make sense. Um, so yeah, if there's anything where, uh, where you guys have examples um, from, from maybe some type of network service that people were working on before network service mesh and it's open source, and then after network service mesh, that story and the code we'd like to use as a sample, um, if we could, um, if you can point me in that direction, and it would be, you know, another outlet for network service mix. Uh, it is part of sample code for the performance. So, no, don't have to answer now, but you know, just something to think about. Definitely. We can we can try finding something. So that's. Um, there's not very many examples uh, before, but we, we can see about trying to find uh, uh, something that's, that meets that requirement. Yeah. Well, I mean, even the, what is it, the Sarah, you know, example, we, well, I don't know if we're still using that, but the, um, where we, we make it to where it's easier to just declare what you want for the security context, whereas before people were trying to maybe hard code, ask for specific ports to be open and all of that stuff. I mean, it can be even that simple. Yeah, because I, my, from, from my recollection of that time period, there was a lot of, um, of uh, static, like static uh, configuration, um, a lot of, um, a lot of work towards like trying to to, to specify things uh, uh, directly, and so I think I, I recall doing uh, demos of this type of stuff back um, uh, around 2016, 2017 ish. Um, I don't know if I have any of them available anymore, but I'll, I'll take a I'll take a look because uh, we could give it a, we could use uh, something similar like. There was an eVPN example that I used to uh, that I used to to use, and it was a real pain to try to get this thing uh, uh, set up and working properly because of all of the manual things that had to be configured in order to try to get the uh, uh, two Kubernetes cluster networks to to work with each other. And so, uh, I'll see if I can that find. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, worst case scenario. I could try reproducing. I could try reproducing it, but uh, it's. I'll, I'll I'll see what I can find. Okay, great. Thanks. Was yeah. there uh, anything else we want to discuss on this particular? Uh, on this particular topic or uh i mean that's that's all i had if you, if you guys want to i mean the the code base is out there as far as what the different tests that we want and it's still very much open so the declarative part is um definitely i mean there's so many parts that nsm can be part of as far as best practices. I know this community has um, definite like certain opinions on what would be best practice, what is cloud native, and the thing that has always jumped out to me is the declarative portion. Um, I, I think that you should have a strong voice on on that type of thing. So, um, Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I would actually suggest being very careful about with just just talking about declarative 
is you can declare all kinds of things that are stupid. Um, so I can, for example, construct a system where I have to declare all the fine minutia of every little detail of the infrastructure that I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm working in. Um, and it's still declarative, but it's also not a terribly smart approach to the problem. So I, I, I think right. declarative is one piece of it, um, but I, I think also like I, it has a sense of immutable infrastructure. Uh, and I would consider IPAM to be part of the infrastructure, right? You can learn about it, you can ask for things from it, but you don't get to dictate it from the outside. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so, no. go ahead. Go ahead. No, I mean, I don't agree. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, one of the things that actually uh, is being discussed um, within the CNF conformance was the fact that uh, these um, small bits of functionality that we call CNFs are supposed to not sh store state, not have state at all. Meaning that uh, things like, you know, uh, IPAM um, can, and I believe should be managed outside. I mean, from the, from the examples that I'm, I'm trying to construct with, uh, with NSM, and actually I'm working on uh, something new now, uh, which I hope I'll be able to announce uh, in the weeks to follow. But uh, from the example that I look at from the practical way of applying NSM, I see a lot of problems exactly regarding to, um, to IPAM. And uh, we, we, we have seen this also with uh, uh, Ericsson with the bridge and then load balancer domain. I mean, uh, I think that the way that we, we approach IPAM today uh, is not the best suited to whatever we try to do. That's what I think. Oh, so in, in what sense? Because I think you and I would agree that, um, that basically something has to manage the IPAM. What I was getting at is uh, an IPAM story that involves putting an environment variable uh, into your pod, assigning it its IPAM in the world, um, and therefore it, that's statically defined, which means all your pod specs everywhere have to come into proper agreement. That was what I was railing against. Does that make sense? Yes, but to me, uh, like no one in the world should be writing pods their own. I mean, there should be, you know, top level orchestration that actually distributes these IP addresses and figures out for you. Uh, like having the inline IPAM, you know, all the DHCP and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you don't get you don't get the the, the top level picture. It's it's very hard to deduct it from the running infrastructure. Um, that's okay. my argument here. Okay. No, I mean, and then this is part of why network service mesh. You know, things like the source and dust IP coming back in from network service mesh. Those are purely optional. If you want to go manage in a, in a different way, um, that's part of why those parameters are optional. Number one, because you may not, um, you know, number one, because you, you may not actually um, want them, right? There are definitely network services for which you wouldn't want IPAM at all. Uh, but number two, you may get them from someplace else. Yeah, yeah it's obviously, but even if you get them from somewhere else, maybe you want to like, introduce them from the service. To, otherwise, your clients need to be privileged. Otherwise, your clients need to be what? I'm sorry? Privileged. Yeah, no, I mean, th this is actually a good point. Um, somebody somebody has to go set those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that somebody has to be privileged. That, and Network Service Mesh handles that because the forwarder, which has to be privileged to insert things like kernel interfaces anyway, um, goes and does that. But when you're talking about user space CNFs, and I, I would expect most CNFs to be user space in some fashion um, and to be using some, some kind of a user space interface because kernel interfaces are very slow. Um, but if you're living purely in user space, then you don't need to be privileged to do those things. Does that make sense? Um, it does to me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, just as much as we expect on the enterprise side, almost all enterprise applications are going to ask for a kernel interface um, because they're written on kernel-y stuff, but they're also not going to be super smart about their own IPAM. Um, on the CNF side of the house, we would expect almost everything on CNF to be using something faster than a kernel interface to move packets around, whether that's SRIOV or MEMIF or 
be host or whatever. Um, does that match what you're expecting to see? Um, UABRBFRA? <laughs> I mean, it's me on this. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I agree with you. Sorry. Okay, good. I mean, because like, just because I have a notion of the world doesn't mean my notion of the world is right, by the way, which is why I ask questions like, does that make sense? Um, it's, it's also, it's, I have a bit of like uh, problems with this, if I can discuss this now, because- Please. Because usually NSM mostly is virtual wires and only cares like point to point connection. So in a way, an IP address is completely useless. You could do on link routing instead if you want to do that, if you see what I mean. Well, it's not so much that the, so NSM itself is point to point connections, but we presume that there is someone on the other side who may be providing a network service that's point to multi point, and that's the someone who knows what the proper IPAM is there. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But, but what I mean with this is that in this protocol between the service and the client, sometimes I can see a need for more data than just the source and the desk IP. I would like to put the VIP address as well to have the forward like, like oh, I'm sorry? A, a VIP address, like a virtual IP. Like when we did this load balancer. Oh, okay. So, so I'm missing like the possibility of transferring more data over this protocol. And this is okay. the data that NSM doesn't really care about, but it's important to the client. So thank you for bringing this up. This actually brings up a, an important point that we should probably go just literally just go fix right now, um, which is um, like literally as soon as this call ends. So when we started out with, so what I think you're saying is that there are other things you might want to put in the connection context. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And, and when we started out with the connection context, it literally started out as just a map, um, a string string map. And we, we did this, and what we came to realize over time was that this was a little bit loose, given that much of what we were passing um, was relatively simple and structured. And so you got things like IP context, Ethernet context, DNS context. And when we did that, we ripped out the string map, this, the map string map, uh, the, the, the map string string. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, you still need some kind of a generic context that gives you that map support. Because even if you do eventually get to a place where you converged on all the things someone might sanely want to pass there, number one, you want people to be able to innovate without having to come and get something upstream, right? So you, giving your example, if you wanted to provide a VIP, right? Um, and I don't know the full depth of what you want to do, but just on the face of it, that sounds like an eminently reasonable thing to want. Um, and I don't know whether or when or if that would ever make its way up to being like a VIP context. That might not make any sense. Mm -hmm. Or it might, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is there ought to be at, in the connection context some sort of a map that you can use for that kind of thing. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I added a map in my hack of it, but I never like, I never- Could you, could you please don't push a patch up that, 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 that adds that to, um, to the API? Because it's something that, that's, that I keep forgetting to go do, but every, it just comes up every few months and it should be done. So please feel free to go push I that up. If you want, but it's, I mean, it's kind of ugly. I just put the map into the struct of the context struct and then, uh -huh. and then the, you, you have to, to regenerate the DRPC, but you know that, of course. That you have, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that, that, that's a perfectly valid thing to want to go add to the API. Okay. Right. So, um, and, and, you know, if you go push that PR, mm -hmm. um, I, I'd love to get that because you're, you're absolutely right. We're never going to be able to see all the things people are going to want here. Right. Yeah. And, and all we can do is codify the things that we think are going to be super common. Yeah. Like the IP context and the ethernet context and the DNS context, and then allow a, a safety valve so people can actually get their work done, which is what you've done in your hack. And we'd love to see a PR for mm -hmm. Um, so that and, and, and you know, I, 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 yeah, that that would be super, super helpful. Yeah, you, I can do that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it, and thank you for bringing it up. Yeah. Right? If, if people don't bring these things up, number one, even if they're things that, like I said, that's been in the back of my mind every, you know, for for months now, but it never got, quite got done, or it, sometimes you bring up things that haven't occurred to people, um, and eventually, I'm super curious to see what you're doing with that VIP parameter. Um, because that does sound interesting as well. No, but I, I also put the, like a, a, tr a hack into the forwarding plane to be able to generate like extra interfaces with the VIP address as well. But that I don't want to push up because I don't think you want to have that. 
Uh, I would certainly like to, to at least understand what you're doing there, just out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, but... I would like to see maybe some kind of plug-in concept to the data plane to be able to like catch stuff in the map. That's certainly de definitely an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's definitely an interesting discussion. And, and this gets to be, um, so I mean, in, in, in one of the things as we're getting more flexible with the forwarders is, you know, there, there's no reason you can't bring your own forwarder that supports your own stuff, for right. example. Right. <clears throat> um, I mean, generally speaking, the one piece of advice I would offer you is that Logically speaking, um, can anything point to point is probably best thought of as a network service. Mm -hmm. Now, implementation wise, where you put that network service from the purpose from the, the purposes of optimization, yeah. um, that may vary, right? But but the logical and the implementational are useful to separate because when you when you have clean cognitive breakdown of what you're doing and where then the where you put it to get implementation optimizations is unlikely to screw you up. But, but I've, I'm sure you've seen this again and again because we're both in networking and have been forever, um, where, where you, you muddy the, the conceptual end of it and suddenly you've got like 15,000 features in one place where they're driving you nuts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and when you can't pull them apart. Right, so just, just for the sake of argument, it sounds like you're using this VIP to do a point to multi point thing and you've hacked the point to multi point thing into your forwarder, right? Yeah, what I did, oh, in, it was into your forwarder, but what I did was like uh, enable the, this uh, load balancing in VPP and it used a GRE tunnel, you know. To, to yeah, no, this is, this, is, this is a fantastic thing, right? Uh, and so, you know, my, my, my counsel to you would be. As long as you consider, continue to think of that as a load balancer network service, which you happen to have optimized by sticking it into the forwarder, so you didn't have to jump through a second VPP, I think you're going to find your life extremely pleasant. But this um, is also something that I thought a bit about most of the stuff we are doing in the service. I mean, if you go end to end, mm -hmm. then uh, to get performance, the application would need to do a poly mode load for something like this. I mean. Uh, and that I mean the application and actual and the real service, but a lot of the stuff we are doing are just infrastructural <clears throat> things, and it would be nice to have an API down to the data plane to actually delegate those kind of stuff, like a remapping of a VLAN tag or something like this. Mm. That that would be an interesting thing to discuss. I mean, one of the things that that you're, you're probably seeing in some of the work with the chain elements yeah. is if you look at the chain elements. Um, the difference between um, anything that you can break up into multiple steps, you can collapse into a single step. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's very much by design um, because there are, there are lots of places where you care more about flexibility than performance, a lot of them. <laughs> but there are definitely places you care way more about performance than flexibility. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It makes a lot, lot of sense. And also I like the abstraction with virtual wires and services because it's a very strong abstraction and you can model almost anything with it. <laughs> I, get the, I get the problem when we implement it so we'll get like native VPPs running in each port container. I would like to push the data, I mean, push the implementation down to the data plane. Yep, no, it sounds like you're, you're doing a reasonable thing and you're thinking about it in a reasonable way. Um, you know, and, and you have some additional thoughts that I'd like to understand better about how to make this a bit more flexible. Yeah. Um, so, and, and so we can definitely carry on some of that conversation about how to make things more flexible because I like flexible. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that's, um, that, that, the, but, but the net net is a, a, a PR to add a map to the context to use for this sort of thing is probably an unalloyed good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you were going to say something, Nikolai? Uh, yeah, I was more like uh, with the new <clears throat> uh, with the new approach to implementing the forwarders. Probably the best thing is to just you know uh, create the forwarder that suits your needs. Uh, it's effectively just another endpoint, uh, so <laughs> mm -hmm. I just uh, I guess that that would be the the best the best approach. I was. While we were talking, I was trying to figure out if we can do something like whatever the CNIs were doing with, you know, kind of chaining different 
uh, for us, but I guess that is just going to get too complicated, at least at this stage, at least until we don't uh, yeah. like move. Maybe at some point we can think about this, but probably not, not today. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, like you still, you can change things. In some sense, yes, uh, yes, the, the, whole, the whole of network service mesh is mm -hmm. uh, chaining things that speak the network service mesh API mm -hmm. together for them to collaborate, sometimes across you know, space and time, and, and sometimes with complete mutual ignorance mm -hmm. in order to give you the thing that you want. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm particularly heartened, um, Anders, that you, you sort of arrived at this solution um, on your own because it is almost exactly what I would have suggested, <laughs> um, which means that, that, that there's, there's some intellectual coherence flowing through the system where, where, where it leads to the right sort of thoughts, uh, which is good. Where are we with this new with the new forwarder architecture? Is that done or uh, no? The, the, it, it's, it's getting there. I just pushed up the command uh, forwarder VPPH and stuff. So there's definitely code you can go look at mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go take a look at where, where that's going. Um, but it, it's we we've just gotten to the forwarder command bit, and there are some other pieces still coming together. Okay. But you'll get some idea of how the pieces fit together. And the, the point that you made about it would be nice if you could go and insert something with additional logic mm -hmm. into it. Um, so what you're going to find is basically everything is a chain of small chain elements that do a piece of work. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go take a look at the command forwarder, you'd see all it's doing is calling something that returns a cross-connect network service. And if you chase back to the SDK VPP agent, you would discover all that's doing is putting together a list of things and so if you wanted to then say, well, I want to go build my own forwarder, mm -hmm. you'd go and write your own chain element that does the thing you want to do with FIPS, and you just build a slightly different chain. That sounds good. Uh, that's because then we can do as far as we want it as well. I mean, I can, I can do everything with it. Exactly. That, that's exactly the idea. And, and, and part of it is to enable experimentation, because quite frankly, um, there are going to be all kinds of bespoke things that people want to do. Yeah. Um, because the, the, the world is, is you know, the networking world is incredibly diverse. And we're going to try and hold the reference implementation to the stuff, to sort of what you might call the, the, the sort of optimized for the average case. But we want to make it as easy as possible for people to solve the other kinds of problems they encounter in their life. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, you want to minimize the amount of code that they have to fork. And if the only code you have to fork is the assembly of a chain, um, then that's going to make your life much nicer. So, cool. Great. Okay, I want to bring one more topic. It's not on the list. I probably should have put it, but uh, oh, right. it's just a quick, uh, quick one. And I think Watson is still here, so he probably have heard this. I don't want to put names here, but uh, there was this discussion in, I believe, in the telecom user group. And it looks like um, folks are trying to pin, for the telecom usage, of course, uh, try to pin the specific networking solution. And uh, we have a good uh, support within, you know, certain, uh, certain communities. Uh, but uh, effectively, when the, when NSM was brought um, on the table, uh, the, the, the pushback response was, it is not production ready yet. I'm just saying this, not like, you know, panic, 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 we should release whatever, whatever. It's mostly like, um, we as a community should be aware that uh, people are expecting more of us. Uh, I know it's easier to say than implement, but, you know. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, no, I, I think that's an important point to get front and center. Um, and and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything to comment. Uh, just like, yeah, <laughs> let's move forward to the best of what yeah, we can the, do. The unfortunate part is a lot of people conflate, like the, they'll compare um, NSM to uh, to uh, Multis or Danm or or Genie or so on, and and the problem that uh, that ends up happening when you make those comparisons is that people will just look at the uh, at the 
CNI multiplexer and say, okay, well, this thing inserts uh, an interface into, into a pod. And then they compare that to NSN because that's with the context that they're only looking at that. And then they say, oh, NSN is not ready. But what they don't see is that NSN is actually solving a different problem and that we've had that specific feature for well over a year in, in production quality, I, I, I dare say. Uh, but the, the, the problem is that NSM itself has, is, is solving a bigger problem of like, how do we solve the, the uh, chaining aspect? How do we get multi-organizational interdomain working? How do we get, um, how do we get uh, these various vendors, uh, SDMs to cooperate with each other and do it in a secure way? And so, uh, and that's before you even look at things like, okay, well, how do we line in a PNF or a VNF into the chain as well? And so the the scope of what uh, what we're doing is is very different from others, but people have conflated uh, our project with uh, with basically a CNI multiplexer in terms of in terms of scope. And so that's part of why we're getting this this uh, these yeah. reactions oh. and. And, and they are right. We, we do need to get a, a production version out there, uh, but it's but there's there's a little bit something there's a little bit more that's it's a little bit bigger that we, that we need to try to uh, that we need to try to tackle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that, that's clear. I, I'm saying like if you are unbiased and you come to the Kubernetes landscape and try to find the networking solution that will suit your needs, being a telco, you would find certain projects, whatever they are are they cni based or whatever it doesn't it doesn't matter i mean you're just looking at what's available and even if we manage to you know gather you know attention which i think is good and uh, uh, you know we do a lot of um, you know publicizing you know the twitter etc et and it obviously you know uh, helps people and hear about us uh, want to look at us you know we get these nice blog posts um, i think that we're doing great on that side but on the other side people are expecting okay nsm is great as an idea uh, i like it i think it's going to solve my problems i want to use it today and um, i don't know maybe we just have to to try to figure out what to when is today <laughs> you know <clears throat> that's uh, just you know Yeah, I, I agree with that. But um, yeah, we should be we should be relatively close, um, especially when you compare it to where we were at like the last uh, the last KubeCon and, and before. So, uh, but we we definitely need to work out with that what those steps are to get something uh, to get something out. And I would argue the the most important things that we needed to finish adding in were things related towards the uh, inner domain and um, specifically around the security and uh, and permissions use case. And we, we now have some stuff in the repo that uh, still needs a little bit more work, but it's very, very close to being uh, done. And then at the very minimum, we should be able to release a, uh, a version that works with the kernel, uh, with the kernel interfaces uh, and and wires things together in, in that respect. And we can spend more time with subsequent uh, releases trying to push out, uh, like, how do we get the SROV work that, uh, that our, uh, the community has been working on? And how do we get the things related towards, uh, towards additional monitoring or additional, uh, or, or how do we get additional things with, uh, like, with, with other, uh, like VFs or, or or so on, so so I think there's there's some interesting stuff in in that respect that uh, that we can push towards. But uh, yeah, I, I think we we should try to carve. We should probably try to carve out sooner than later what uh, uh, the parts that are stable and, and build a story around that as a, as an initial release. Uh, at least that, that that's my opinion towards it. Okay, maybe I don't know. I mean, I don't have a, any particular <laughs> plan or answer today. It's just like, yeah, I, I, I think this is a, a healthy discussion. I think your distinction, Frederick, um, is actually a good one because essentially, um, the 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 CNI multiplexer solves such a narrow corner of the problem space that 
you know, it's essentially saying we're going to go settle on the thing that we're not even sure we can use to solve the broader problem, but because there's a thing there, um, we're going to settle on it. Um, because it, literally it's not clear that there is a generic broader solution to the problem. I mean, you can always go get a bespoke per vendor thing, but I think that's what they're trying to avoid. Exactly, and uh, that's the, um, and, and, and that's part of the, part of the challenge is like how do we and and the people who are in the in the calls for the most part i i, I don't think that there's like uh any malicious uh, intent or anything like that like they're they're looking at it from the context of uh, as best as as best as they can and the stories that they're hearing are nsm's not ready we have multis and danim and so on and those are ready and so, and the thing that we want from NSM is multiple interfaces. So why would we want anything? Why would we want anything more? And then when they start visiting the harder problems, because they've already pre-selected a solution, they're not thinking of NSM as a, as a thing. And mm -hmm. it's been, and so. the, Those harder problems really are where I think ultimately life gets interesting. Um, because effectively, at a very fundamental level, I don't think you can solve those harder problems with a solution where everything is set in stone at pod startup time. And, and so I, I think that fundamentally makes any solution that is constructed that way a dead end at the end of the day. I will agree with you, but uh, the, 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 the thing that I get all the time is show me those examples where these actually are needed. Like, which is the example that actually can demonstrate how NSM utilizes this dynamism, this flexibility that it brings? Every CNF ever? <laughs> I'd like to demo those examples too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, literally, it's literally every CNF ever, because here's the thing. Um, if you, if you, if, here's the very fundamental thing. If I have a CNF, right? And there are other things that need to connect to that CNF, right? So if I want to do any kind of chaining at all, then I have, I need to have some kind of a connection between CNF one and CNF two. Um, now those two CNFs, one of them, no matter what you do, one of them is already going to have completed its startup process when the other comes up. So whoever has completed the startup process will not be able to change to accommodate the addition of a new client in any reasonable -ish sort of way number one. But number two, um, if you have CNF1 and CNF2 and they're supposed to be connected to each other and CNF2 crashes, dies, or otherwise goes away, CNF1 is now marooned. Not only is it no longer receiving the service that it needs, but it literally cannot get the service that it needs from anyone else um, because everything about its networking was set in stone at the beginning of time. Mm, that's not how uh, services work in Kubernetes. Uh, services are doing a very different thing. Yeah. Services are carrying a payload over um, a Kubernetes intracluster network. Um, and they make this fundamental presumption that every pod can reach every other pod. Is mm -hmm. it true that yes. you want every CNF to reach every other CNF? Well, I mean, you still have, uh, you know, policies and uh, things. I mean, Right, right. But is it true that you want every CNF to be able to reach every other CNF? Um, and do you want to pay the performance penalty yeah. involved? Okay. That? I don't think yeah. that we sh should try to resolve <laughs> all the problems now, but it, it, yeah. It, but basically, that, that the really fundamental thing is that um, the, the, the better analogy is not to services. The better analogy is saying, what if every TCP connection that you needed had to be established in your pod spec at the time your pod started up? That's the analogy. Okay, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we just need to. And if you're a server, every client, TCP connection for every client also had to be. <laughs> right. that, that's literally the analogy to the situation. And just like anybody would obviously see that requiring static at, you know, static and fixed in time at pod startup time, TCP connections is insane. It's the same thing. So uh, we're pretty much out of time. So um, I think we'll have to continue this discussion at a, at a later time. Um, but there's clearly a there's clearly a problem that needs to be solved, and um, and I.
think we're on track, regardless of the difference of opinions, I think we're on track to uh, to solve such a uh, such a range of problems. And so, uh, is there anything else? In, any last uh, minute comments that uh, or uh, announcements that anyone else has? Cool, with that, thank you everyone and we will see you all next week at the same time. Take care. See you. Bye. Bye.